and welcome or welcome back to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast, coming to you not quite live, but certainly direct from the Vitality Stadium to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the Cherries. For those who haven't tuned in before, my name's Chris Temple. I'm Cherries commentator for BBC Radio Solent and AFCB TV. And my regular partner in crime on here is a man I've known and worked alongside for almost 20 years, AFCB club journalist Neil Perrett. Neil, good day. Good day, Chris. And uh, we're in for a treat today, Neil, on the pod, as we link AFC Bournemouth with the boxing ring. Now, you declared on Twitter just recently that you're 19 and a half stone, which I think is on the generous side. Uh, that probably puts you first in line, if we're talking boxing, for the winner of Fury against Joshua? A hundred million pound a man, I think they're on. I'll probably take one punch for that fraction of that, if Eddie Hearn's listening, Chris. If you're listening, Eddie, it's at Neil Perrett under, underscore on Twitter for you to look at his photo and realise he definitely isn't 19 and a half stone. Add a, add a two on the front of that, you might be closer. Anyway, our guest on this episode is a man who certainly isn't 19 and a half stone. He's put Bournemouth, though, firmly on the map recently in non-football circles. Now, it's going to be extremely cliche, but I'm going to do this anyway. Talking out of the red and black corner, the current and defending Commonwealth and Continental Cruiserweight Champion from Bournemouth, England, we welcome the gentleman, Chris Billum Smith. Am I going to get a job, Chris, no? Oh, David Diamante <laughs> might, have, might have his work out there. <laughs> Goodness, that'll be so bad. I'll probably get cut out and I'll have to do it again later. Uh, Chris, welcome to the podcast. It's an absolute pleasure for me and Neil to, to be joined by you today. First of all, you're an elite sports person. You've been in training camps, in arenas, in this current times as a Cherries fan. I know you're not quite in the stadium, but what's it like to be back inside the four walls of the Vitality? No, uh, thanks for having me on. It's a, an honour to be back in, in the stadium and had a quick look at the pitch and uh yeah it's uh I miss it I miss being being here watching the lads play but uh no thanks so much for having me on it's an absolute pleasure as you say now you're also a podcast host yourself you sit in this seat probably a bit better than we do uh which we'll come on to a little bit later on but let's start back recently shall we with with where you're at before we come on to the story behind your career and how you ended up in Bournemouth and everything else uh you beat Vasil Dussar on points on the 20th of March at Wembley Arena um as a professional boxer in a recovery, I guess, from a from a fight, tell us about your day today. What What is a, a fighter? What are we, nine, 10 days on from a fight now? What are you up to? Uh, I think I've, I've, done a, I've done a few runs. I'm, I'm not one to be able to sit still. Uh, I think that my time off is mainly time off from my diet. Uh, I've definitely eaten uh, more than I, I should be. Uh, a few pizzas here and there. But no, I've been doing a few runs, uh, just mainly for my, my mind, you know, in, in the morning down the sea, a few sea dips as well, um, and a few strength sessions here and there, but I, I love training and I love, you know, it's good for my, my mentality and I'm not uh, not the, the finished article yet, so I've got us to keep progressing as well. So uh, I've just been doing bits and pieces, but definitely relaxing as well. Uh, I try and get out of the house as much as possible, while, especially while my wife's working at home. I don't want to annoy her too much. It's a good excuse anyway for getting out of the house. Um, okay, we'll, we'll come back to the boxing and to the, your love of the cherries very shortly. But let's, as we like to do with all our guests, wind it right back. Because if we look you up, it says you were born in Epsom in Surrey. So just tell us how you ended up finding your way down here to Bournemouth. Yeah, I was uh, born in Epsom, but we were grew up sort of in Tadworth, which is sort of South London. Um, and we lived in, a, I think my, my parents had a, a two bed flat and a block of flats with three, three sons. So uh, that was probably very hectic for him. I don't have many memories of that. Uh, we moved down to Bournemouth when I was three years old. Uh, so for me, it's, it's all I've ever known, really. Uh, it's, it's definitely home. Uh, very fortunate to, to live down here. So uh, yeah, then we moved down here in 1993. So it was, uh, that's, that's why I call it home. And that's why Bournemouth's my team. Went to school at Starfield Juniors in Iford and then Porchester School. Chris, give us your early memories of being at those two schools. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was I was football mad as a kid, and uh, I think when I was ten, I was I managed to. I think most kids did, but they you know got on the Cherries at Academy and, and stuff like that when I was ten years old, I think. Um, but yeah, the, I was always always wanted to be captain and centre of attention and, and stuff like that. So uh, I think I was captain of the school team at, at Stalfield, um, and then uh, a few club teams growing up through my teenage years and stuff, but. Uh, Port Jester was great as well. Um, I loved it. Loved it there. Obviously, it's just over the road from the stadium. I used to live just down the road, so uh, it was yeah. It's it feels you know Kings Park where we are now is and by the stadium around the stadium. I spent spent half my childhood you know playing around here. Whether that's playing football, we used to train over there on the field, um, just next to the stadium. So uh, this is all very local for me. 
Do you play with anyone who might have gone on to make make their name in the football world? Uh, not that I could think of. Um, uh, my mate used to play with Adam Lalana uh, at Little Down Juniors as a kid, and uh, yeah, I actually saw Adam last week. He joined us for a C dip because he's uh, he's friends with a few lads I know. So uh, that was that was good. So he, uh, we we managed to, to get him in the in the C. And uh, yeah, so that was uh, an experience, you know, Champions League and Premier League winner, uh, getting getting in the sea with us, for forcing him in the sea, making him nice and uncomfortable. <laughs> Just tell us you had a little break when you were at school where you went off travelling. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, I was uh, very much a spoiled child, I think. Uh, we, uh, my parents downsized the house where we used to live and they wanted to go travelling before they reached 50 and my brothers have both left school. Uh, this is I was 11 at the time. I'd just finished junior school. Uh, and they decided to take us traveling around Australia uh, for a year. Well, it was meant to be a year, end up being eight months. So we started in, in Perth in Western Australia and literally went up the West Coast all the way across. Uh, spent eight months out there uh, playing zero football because it's, it's, you know, soccer isn't massive over there. But um, I was doing a lot of BMXing and bodyboarding and different sports and just... I guess living the dream you know it's what most people do when they leave school I've managed to do it in instead of school um and that's like I said uh, it's probably why I'm a boxer and, and not not a doctor or something like that uh having a year off of school but it didn't affect me too much I think it helped me a lot you know with myself and sort of when I look back I'm quite a sociable person and I seem to get on can get on with people quite well and I think that was a massive learning curve for me and uh I still need to repay my parents somehow, uh, maybe take them traveling for a bit. But um, yeah, it's a, it was a great experience. When you were growing up, the club was predominantly third and fourth division and it was a lot more fashionable as a, as a schoolboy to support a Premier League team. What made you choose the Cherries? Um, well, I I'm probably shouldn't say this on podcast, but I did have my own Premier League team. Uh, now, I was a Bournemouth fan, uh, but I did, have, I did like Chelsea as well when I was younger. But... Um, you know, I never even saw Chelsea play until I went to watch them oh, an away game with, with Bournemouth. So, um, but yeah, I just, it was, like I said, I grew up in, you know, in where the stadium is. It was, I liked sporting local team and um, yeah, it was a great, great experience for, for me just to, to come to games and stuff. And um, yeah, and uh, obviously I had a season ticket when I was 12, 13 years old and sat in the North Stand just behind Nonny. So uh yeah. My, my eardrums are a little bit blown from that, but uh, it was a, a class experience and I, I uh, you know, I value those memories hugely. So just for the record there, Chris, Chelsea were your second team. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay, just at school, we all had a hard man in our year when we were at school. Were you the hard man in your schools? <laughs> Absolutely not. I didn't even box till I left school. Uh, I started boxing when I was 16. I just went to college and, and met a mate of mine. So uh, yeah, no, at school I was, I was all mouth and... All mouth for no action, I think. I was quite a, a cocky little kid, to be honest, and uh, definitely learned, learned how to act properly. Um, probably look back, at, if I was my own son now, I'd be probably quite ashamed of myself, so looking back. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, I was just, I was the youngest of three brothers. So with them, you know, having those older brothers and you just, you get, get a lot of confidence and act, act a certain way around school. But uh, no, I definitely, definitely wasn't the hard man. I think most people, I mean, I can certainly remember, like you, Chris, I support a lower league team, which regular Bournemouth fans will know actually Gillingham is my, my home team, but I supported Arsenal as a, as a youngster as well. And my first ever game was Arsenal against Watford, which in 1985 or something, which sticks out for me uh, as a memory. Can you remember your first time here in the stadium watching Bournemouth? It was actually when I was uh, in the academy under 10s, uh, funnily enough, against Arsenal. It was uh, the, I think it was Arsenal B team playing, playing, uh, playing the, Bournemouth so we had got given tickets because you're in the Cherries Academy you got given tickets so uh, it was Arsenal reserves it was one game and I think there was a Chelsea reserves as well game as well so that was the first my first memories of being in the stadium um, and then like I said I had a season ticket when I was I came a couple of times to the terraces when when we had the terrace sand and uh, but can't really remember those games uh, but my, my main memories are sitting in the north stand for, for two seasons um, and yeah great memories. As a big strapping six foot three lad like you are now, I presume Steve Fletcher was one of the early guys that caught your eye, was he? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, big Fletcher was obviously, I, I would have been, my season ticket would be now in his his stand. And uh, yeah, he was, he, he was, you know, uh, he was a class class player. And back then he was the target man. 
him and Hater were a dangerous, dangerous partnership. And uh, I actually was uh, a mascot for his testimonial. Uh, so I, was, I think I walked out of Carl Broadhurst and uh, yeah, did a lap of the pitch, clapping the fans and with, with my mate, who was the, the Pompey mascot. Uh, and my cousin was a Pompey mascot as well because he was a Pompey fan. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I've still got the shirt from the testimonial, which I need to get Fletch to sign at some point. Uh, I don't think it fits me anymore, though. I was probably, what, 14, 15 then. So, yeah, I'm not sure it would fit me anymore. I feel like now you should be signing memorabilia for Fletch, not the other way around, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, Steve Fletcher, who, who else, as a, either growing up or even watching now, are your your AFC Bournemouth? I'm putting heroes in inverted commas here. Yeah, I mean, my my team you know when i had a season ticket was very much wade elliott you know um stephen purchase was obviously in in the side then and eddie was was playing um as well around that time and then it's like neil moss and goal uh cummings at left back and uh gareth o'connor who uh you know i was mentioning earlier to neil i said that i used to get someone to put a bet on me when there was a little betting station underneath the north stand get someone to put a bet on for me you know put a pound on him to score first goal and he won me a lot of money because he was always <laughs> quite long odds and uh and uh, so that was always always fun but yeah um and then obviously james, james hater and fletcher were always up top um remember brian stock as well you know i remember the cardiff uh league cup game where he scored uh scored the last minute free kick and that was probably the best game i've ever been to even though we lost on penalties it was i think it was a tuesday night game and it was just a massive memory for me of the best football experience ever even though we lost because it was just such an epic game we scored in like the 90th minute or late late 80 minutes and then again in late in uh extra time as well to equalize so uh yeah that they uh, were very good memories and they're the players i remember most were you i'm just trying to work out the timings were you here for the james hater hat trick night yeah i was i was actually took my mate was a ball boy um and me and my other mate had a season ticket and we were talking to him. We were, we were probably on the video because we were talking to him as it was, you know, it was like last minute or towards the end of the game and the game was won. We were just down the front talking to him and then we look up and he was through for his <laughs> goal after goal after goal. It was just, he was through for his... Uh, through for his hat trick so we're probably on the video but it's probably not the best quality so you couldn't tell it's us but uh i i promise you i was there just want to put it on the record there that unlike the two chris's here i don't support another team by the way so uh, <laughs> what, a hero, Neil. what a hero i reckon you were about 12 uh when we were in the division three playoff final at the millennium millennium stadium chris did you go to that no i was unfortunately uh i wanted to i tried and begged my mum to uh to let me go but we had a family uh party up in in leicester some family friends i had to watch it and uh watch it on tv which is which was obviously nice to be able to watch, watch it on tv but uh yeah it was uh unfortunately i couldn't make it and i couldn't get my way out of this you know i was still way too young i was a, a mummy's boy as well so i had to listen to my mum and uh i mean i still am and i still listen to her now but uh <laughs> yeah it was uh unfortunately i didn't get to go to the game but it was it was still the result we wanted did you have any money on Gareth O'Connor to score that day? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> Couldn't have anyone to put it on for me. So you said you had a season ticket. Just tell us what, what period was that and when, when did that sort of stop? I think it was uh, two seasons. Me and my friend got a, an absolute bargain, I think, because we were junior cherries, which was what, like a fiver or something. You get a half price season ticket. I think the season ticket was 60 quid. So all in, it cost us 35 quid for a season ticket, which... <laughs> No, you're, you're lucky to get a ticket for that in, in the in the well, especially in the last five years. But um, no, it was uh, that that season. Uh, I think that was 2002, 2003 season, and then 03, 04 as well. Um, so I had a season ticket there. My mate didn't have one for the second season, so I used to come walk up on my own and and just sit, like I said, behind Nonny and in the uh, the famous left side, as they like to call it over there. And uh, yeah, it was. Uh, sat there in my, my fake stone island jacket thinking i was around the time green street came out i think so uh i was thinking i was one of the boys but uh definitely was not up for any of that so that junior cherries membership's only gone up two two pounds in almost 20 years what value that, that is. is great value now you you've told us that you you played a little bit of football when you're at school and you played for the school team just tell us did you want to be a footballer yeah i mean that was my childhood i, I always wanted to be a professional footballer and you know, I had, like I said, I uh, was like having trials for the academy and stuff when I was like, under 10s and then thought I'd just keep working. And then my parents, obviously, we went away for uh, eight months. And all I ate, used to, I was such a fussy eater. And then all I used to eat was pies, cheese, toasted cheese sandwiches and chips. And that was all I ate in Australia, I think, for 
for, for eight months. Yeah, I mean, that's been my diet for the last week, to be fair. But um, uh, yeah, I think uh, I came back. I was a little bit overweight. I started playing again uh, for a brand score when I was, because I, I briefly went to school at Homefield when I came back um, and then closed down and stuff. So uh, before I moved to Porchester, and then, um, yeah, it was, uh, I was playing there and just I soon realized that it wasn't, it wasn't to uh wasn't to be I was you know I was I was way behind that sort of level but I, I still believed till I was probably about 15 that I'd be a professional footballer and uh but it, it wasn't to be but I had that mindset you know I'd play on a Sunday morning so I wouldn't drink on a Saturday night and I think that's all that sort of mindset has put me in good stead uh to the career I eventually ended up having. Now we, we gather you're a bit of an all-rounder at, at sports school you tried a lot of things you went skiing and all sorts of not every other sport you could try where, where else did you, some of your specialisms lie or did you literally were you jack of all trades and hadn't quite mastered one by then yeah i mean uh I, I, there's not a sport i didn't try I used to play hockey on a sunday morning and football on a sunday afternoon uh i went diving on thursday nights down pool dolphin center um i was i tried I, badminton i was i was on, got on to the dorset squad but there was you know probably 30 40 50 kids there and I was by far the worst uh, I used to go there on a Sunday for two hours when I stopped playing hockey and um, yeah it's not that I did karate as a kid briefly fencing uh, all sorts of trampoline and I actually got an A star in my practical and GCSE <laughs> um, so just, I was just yeah I, I loved all sports I was just that kid and I was always going to end up in sports in one way or another and obviously I did personal training and stuff at, at college as well so um yeah, that that was sport was always my my love, and I started boxing when I left school and ended up being half right at it. So uh, carried it on. You mentioned your mum earlier on. I think I'm right saying she lives almost. You can almost see her house from the stadium. Can you a bit further over the park? Yeah, yeah. She's just in in, in Boscombe, just uh just off Sea Road. So she, she, you know, she likes walking down to the pier and stuff. So. It's uh yeah it's nice and close nice and close to here. It sounds like she had her work cut out ferrying you or your your family did ferrying you around to all these things when you were youngsters. Yeah, I mean I I owe everything to my mum my and dad. My dad was always away working. He works on, in the film industry, and uh, yeah he was always you know earning earning the money. And uh, my mum was just so supportive of me. Anything I wanted to do or didn't want to do, it was never pushy or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I I uh, like I said I owe him a lot. Um, you mentioned uh, your boxing when it started to take off. Uh, Wikipedia, that official source, uh, mentions you were about 16 when you started to, to take it seriously. Is that about right? And what, what sort of, what clicked for you then? What was it that you decided, okay, this is this is what I want to do now? Yeah, I, um, I first started, well, 16 was when I started training properly. Um, I met a mate at college called Dean Perkins and he was, uh, we'd become really close. So I went in started training with him and then I went and watched him fight and it was everyone was there chanting Dino like just and I just remember stopping the chant and just thinking that must be an amazing feeling to have that atmosphere like I said I'm the youngest of three brothers so being center of attention was was very much uh at the forefront of my mind so I thought that must be an epic feeling it, for me that was as a kid I wanted you know you wanted 11,000 fans chanting your name playing for a football team but um boxing that was was you know everyone was there just for you uh and I I watched that and I was like right next year on this show I'm gonna I'm gonna box on this show next year and uh, I ended up having a f one fight before then and, and then my second fight was on the same show exactly a year later and I just fell in love with the sport I just I only did it to get fit for football originally um, and then just that that feeling of just it's all on you I absolutely love you know you can have the best game of your life as a footballer and still lose and I hated not being in control of that and uh it, I'd now obviously anything win lose or draw in, in boxing it's it's down to you it's it's in your hands and uh, I guess I like having that control come back to boxing next Chris have you ever been to watch a world cup finals football match at school we uh we were in we'd just leaving school and uh at Porchester and the the school actually got ripped off for some tickets and then like some fake tickets for a school trip for a younger year then they got given like double the amount for other games. So they, the kids that were meant to go before were all went. And then we were at a really close, all my friendship group were really close with our sports teachers. And uh, they actually took us to Germany, Portugal, third place playoff final in Stuttgart. Um, and no, there was no one, uh, no ID over there. There was just, you know, we get, got a coach over there, got off the coach. The, well, our teachers trusted us enough, whether that was wise or not I don't know but um, they trusted us enough to go off into uh, into Stuttgart for the day and uh, we were just basically doing a pub crawl I was actually was I, f I think I was 15 at the time because uh, 
15 years old and 16 uh, i mean i don't drink anymore but i had a we had a few drinks that day um and it was just an epic sort of 48 hour trip uh the worst thing was watching the football and obviously as we're all football fans but it was just such a an eventful day with bars and stuff and just madness of, of being at a world cup and a you know, fair place playoff and it was just it was just crazy how uh how we were over there and it was all very last minute because of the, the way it worked out um but yeah that was uh a great experience a great trip and one that will always live uh very be a very fond memory of mine that's a fantastic answer chris if we can just cut the bit out about the underage drinking that will be uh appreciated <laughs> thanks very much <laughs> now then representing paul amateur boxing club as an amateur obviously when you were much younger you reached two aba championship finals and you lost both how much of a dent was that to you uh yeah it was uh it's tough to take especially the first one the first one we were certain I'd won it. Um, I got out the ring and someone who was sat next to the judge who worked for the, the the amateur governing body grabbed my arm and said, you were absolutely robbed there, mate. So it was hard to see him getting given the, the trophy and the, I think he got a belt then as well. And uh, that was tough to date against Jack Massey, who hopefully, and I'll be able to get my revenge now because he's, he's a, a pro, he's only lost one, he's, he's doing well. Um, but yeah, that was 2013. But I got a Great Britain assessment off the back of it, and it was a really good, you know, uh, really good year for me. I'd had, I think I ended up having eight or nine fights that year, and only losing that one in the final. So it, it was always a longer process. It's not obviously you you go into championships wanting to win them, but for me, it's never the end goal. It's you know, it's constant progression, uh, and it's all about my performance rather than the result. Uh, and I, I was pleased with how I performed, so I took it as well as I could. Um, I remember my brother crying his eyes out he'd had a few drinks and crying his eyes out being absolutely gutted for me um but yeah it was uh it, it, we were up in up in Sunderland and uh didn't get a decision but it was a, we still made a good night of it and um obviously the the second one was uh was in in Liverpool at the Echo Arena and uh boxed three times in three days and lost a, a good fighter in Chev uh Chevron Clark who's now on the Great Britain squad uh hopefully gets a chance to make the Olympics um, I think he won a bronze at the Commonwealth Games, so um, yeah, lost, lost that one. That was another close one, but his, his style probably, you know, the judges would definitely favour his style. Style, but um, yeah, it just drives you on. I think you know, you can they can make your break you losses like that. Um, for me, you just got to keep looking how you can improve and how you can get better. So um, I don't don't regret the results at all. I just use them as as more fuel to the fire. A friend of a friend was watching you boxing on the TV the other day and he said I'm sure that guy used to deliver a Chinese takeaway to me now is there any truth you were once a Chinese takeaway delivery driver that is true uh for Dragon Palace in, in on Barrack Road and uh unfortunately I heard it's closing down which is, is sad I used to love love working for them it was uh four hours on a Friday night four hours on a Saturday night um I used to deliver Chinese and I, it was it was eventful, you know, but I enjoyed it. I, it was a very simple job, uh, not the best paid unless it was Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. Then I used to work them until about half eight, and then you'd earn your you probably earn about twenty quid an hour doing that. Then so that was all right, good money just for driving some food around. And uh, no, yeah, I, I enjoyed that job. It was a, uh, it was one of the, the more enjoyable jobs. I've had a, a long list of different jobs I've done, but uh, yeah, no, that is that is true. Turning pro, you were snapped up by Barry McGuigan's Cyclone Promotions. Just explain how that all unfolded. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was, I was friends with Sh Shane McGuigan, who's now my coach. Obviously, Barry's son. Uh, I was friends of his right hand man on Facebook. I just used to accept anyone thinking, you know, has not. My mum said he never had too many friends. Don't think she meant on Facebook, but nonetheless, it was uh, accepted. Everyone it was friends with him on Facebook. He messaged me one day saying. Can you come and spar in London tomorrow? Never even spoke to him before. Just sort of knew we we're both in the boxing world. Uh, and yeah, and he just messaged me saying, can you come and spar in London tomorrow? And I said, yeah, no worries. Uh, what time and where? And he sent me the address, said you'll be doing six hours with George Groves, who at the time had just lost his third world title fight to Badu Jack. Uh, and no one knew he was training with Shane. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting link up. Like, uh, so I went and sparred George and in London. Um, and I think it was George's first spar under Shane as well. And for me, George Groves was my favorite fighter. So it was, it was crazy to think at the time that, you know, I'm going to just share the ring with him. I, I said to him after the spar, after the first spar, I said, oh, it's, thanks, George, it's an honor to share the ring with you. Um, 
and yeah, and then Shane just kept getting me back to Spa George. I did a little bit of David Hay because he was training David Hay at the time as well. Um, and then when it got round to, you know, I had my GB assessments and uh, got to the third, the final stage and didn't get in. I wanted to turn pro, so I just I asked Shane, and uh, thankfully he said he said yes, and thought I'd start at the top and work my way down. He was obviously a very sought after trainer, um, one of the best in the world. I think he's proven that time and time again at such a young age as well. And uh, yeah, for for me, I just thought I'd start there, and if not, you know, maybe he can advise me on someone to go with. Um, and then thankfully he took me on. I think it was meant to be on a part time basis, but uh, I just turned up on a Monday. I didn't leave till Friday, so <laughs> it, it was all right. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it, it's worked out superb. Me and Shane are really good friends. We've got a really good relationship. And then obviously, with Shane, get Barry and, and Cyclone, and they 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 had a, a lot of shows on Channel Five at the time. Uh, and I was able to box down here, which is you know some promoters only like you to box on their show, but they were happy for me to keep building. Um, and I had four fights in eleven weeks at the beginning of my career, which is unheard of because uh, I got to box obviously at the O2 Academy in Boscombe on my debut and then have uh, fights on, on undercards of the, the Cyclone shows and also George Groves won. Um, so yeah, at Wembley Arena, I then I managed to get four fights in 11 weeks. So yeah, it's, uh, it was a great link up to, to link up with obviously such massive names and, and I've become friends with them and, and you know, and you know, their family when it comes to boxing. So it's, uh, it's really, I, I owe a lot to them as well because it's been such a good relationship and uh, thanks to them and got me to where I am now. I don't think it would be unfair, Chris, to say that Bournemouth is not a hotbed for boxing. So obviously for you to break out, if you like, from Bournemouth into the, the, the bright lights, and there'll be a lot of football fans listening to this who have a passing interest in boxing. I would describe myself as a layman sort of boxing fan. I watch all the big fights. But actually behind the scenes, you talk about your route there into various promotions and then onto certain shows. How much of that are you still battling? Do you still battle for yourself in? How much do you have a manager who leads everything? How much do you do you get scouted in the early stages by by, for example, you know, Cyclone promotions. How how much of it is controlled by managers and promoters for someone at your level now? Uh, now it's, I mean, it's, you know, my fights get decided by Shane and, and the team uh, with obviously Eddie Hearn. I've been on his show for the last four or five fights. Um, so yeah, the, the, the fights get offered to Shane and then they say yes to the opponent and then you know, negotiate a purse, uh, and that's they work for for you. You know, that that's what they they get their percentages for, um, and they're they're superb at it, and they they really look after me. You know, they try and get the the most money they can, which in a sport of boxing isn't isn't what everyone sees. It's not your Mayweathers and your Joshuas. It's not your driving Lamborghinis and and all those sort of things. And uh, and if you don't fight, you don't get paid unless you've got sponsors. Um, so it's a it's a real tough business and it's only the you know i always say it's only less than one percent that can retire and never have to work again um so it's uh it's a tough business so you have to have a good team around you and i'm very fortunate to have that you, the team around you i mean barry mcguigan when he was world featherweight champion in the mid 1980s you weren't born i was only just born neil was about 40. um what's it like having someone like barry mcguigan in your camp someone with such a standing in the sport as he's got yeah he's obviously a massive name he's an absolute a hero he's a he's a hall of famer you know to be in the boxing hall of fame you can't you can't just be anyone um and what he did used his you know status for over in ireland and bringing you know the protestants and catholics together and everyone you know there was when he boxed everyone was watching it and a lot of them were watching it together and he really done a lot um but also his passion for the sport now is is still he's there every sparring session you know, there's no need for him to come and watch some random kid for Bournemouth who's had one pro fight with his son to, you know, he's not bothered, but he he's genuinely has a has an interest in it and wants us to do well. Um, and he's, you know, he's so passionate about the sport still. He'll, you hear him ringside, um, probably heard him the other night on, on the TV, he was, he was saying saying lots, you can hear, when I watched it back, I could hear him because obviously there's no no crowds there. So he's, uh, he's very heavily invested in even the lads he doesn't manage, like he doesn't, manage Anthony Fowler or, or Lawrence O'Coley, but he's still there in the gym for all their sparring sessions and helping them as well. Um, so yeah, he's it's, uh, having someone like that in the gym who's been there, done it, got the t-shirt and and the belts and uh, and the Hall of Fame status and he's still there just helping some some lad from Bournemouth. You know, it's, it's great to have him in, in, the, in the corner. 
We'll come back to your, your Cherries links in a moment, but obviously I know you get a lot of support from Cherries fans as well, don't you? And I don't know if it's by design, but your your CBS branded kit you're wearing is red and black in front of us. Is that by design? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I had to stick with the, the form of colours, <laughs> the, the Cherries colours, you know. <laughs> I haven't kept up with the uh, the new training kits and stuff, but uh, yeah, I've always gone with black, red and gold because of uh, the Cherries. We'll come back to your branded kit in a minute because that's one of our fans' questions actually. But just before we, uh, we obviously it'd be remiss of us not to talk about your amazing success over the last couple of years, but where does the gentleman your nickname come from i mean i think myself and neil have already found out the first time we've met you that that's very much the case but whose idea was it to call you professionally the gentleman yeah we were looking for a nickname in the gym uh we couldn't think of one uh my brothers have always joked and, and called me the golden child because i was spoiled as a kid and i always got my way with uh with my um with my mum and stuff so they joked and called me the golden child and that's the only name i i sort of might have had uh but then when I hadn't been to any Olympic Games or Commonwealth Games and got a gold medal, it didn't quite fit. Uh, and then they were trying to think of a name in the gym and stuff like that. And I was, I, I had no idea. And Shane just said, what about the gentleman? Uh, and they all liked it. And then uh, Shane's brother, Blaine, was wanting to uh, say just gentleman. But Shane was like, oh, the gentleman. And we're Amun and Aaron. Because there's been a few, you know, uh, monikers in the in the past of like uh gentleman jim corbett who's a, a good boxer and uh so I, I just went with the gentleman and it just it just stuck so yeah he, uh shane come up with it i don't know whether i maybe i just said please more than the other lads in the gym and uh and that was it just looking over my shoulder chris i'm a bit worried we might need to take a little break i'm looking in the car park and there's a lamborghini out there cbs one getting a ticket and that's not yours is it <laughs> Oh, won't be one day. I don't think I'd, I'd choose a Lambo, but uh, that would be, yeah, that's definitely not mine. Cast your mind back to September 2017, Chris, your first pro fight against Russ Henshaw at the O2 Academy. One with a first round knockout. Must have been a dream start to your pro career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as an amateur, I'd won, well, technically I had two stoppages. Uh, one was a cut, so that's not really a class as a stoppage as, as such, but... Uh, and the other one was unfortunately the same lad uh, in, a, in a later fight and I, I stopped him on his feet and it, I wasn't really known as a, a big puncher, I was an out and out boxer, but when I joined Shane and that, it was something they taught me to believe in my punch power a bit more and uh, I, I dropped a few lads in the gym and sparring and started believing in myself more. So to then go into your pro debut when the gloves are a bit smaller and there are men in there and they're, they're, they set their feet more and they really let them go uh, to get in there with uh Russ Henshaw I was actually I would was going to box him in the amateurs at one stage um and then yeah and I knew a lot of lads who had boxed him uh through their careers bef before me had stopped him early I wasn't going in there looking for it but it, it just came and uh it was just such an amazing feeling to walk out you know like I said it's probably 400 meters away from my mum's house uh my mum's flat where she lives now so I'm, I'm there and it, just walking out the the arena's probably where I had my first kiss at some under 18s <laughs> night. Uh, and uh, I've been to so many gigs there as well. So I'm walking out on the stage. It's just a great arena. The noise just echoes around and I had obviously, you know, probably over 100 tickets for it, 150 tickets or something. And to have loads of friends and family there and to perform like I did and get the first round knockout, it was a real special moment for me and one I'll, I'll always, always remember in my career. Just a quick one, Neil, before you cut. This is the Opera House, of course, for those who may yes. have a slightly older. Now, this is a very, I've heard you describe this as maybe the, the punters watching ants in a soup can because it is a tall, cylindrical, not not a, an ideal venue, but as you say, maybe a, an amazing venue in terms of noise if you're the homeboy. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, is that, I just, that's the best way I can describe it is is that just imagine just a cylinder of people just with a, a, a ring at the bottom of it. And it's that's all it is. It's not like a, a rectangular venue. It's made for music and the acoustics and very small arena uh, i think only uh, we now i don't think we've ever sold it out but i think only 900 fit in there so i think we've probably had 600 at a show it's not a huge amount of people but the noise in there is just absolutely epic it's a great little arena so yeah the uh the old opera house uh, has changed a little bit i think my brother used to go to raves there uh, and i used to get under 18s nights but uh yeah it's changed a little bit so to to have my debut there was a real special experience i'm glad you reminded us that it used to be the opera house i remember that kissing area quite well <laughs> <laughs> anyway um ahead of your second pro fight october 2017 you met eddie howard Wembley Arena that must have been a special moment for you yeah it was uh 
Bournemouth were away at Tottenham when they were playing at Wembley. Uh, it was the Friday we had the way in uh, just across from the arena uh, and, and the stadium at a, a place over there. And then me and George were weighing in. Um, I was weighing in after George because I was sort of with the team and George Groves was in the world title fight, etc. And he went and weighed in and then everyone left the room and then I quickly jumped on the scales just to to say so they could tick off my name. Uh, but we were in the in the waiting area before the weigh-in and George just goes, oh, Chris, I bought your mate. I turned around and Eddie Howe was there and I was like, just, I was probably like a bit starstruck to be honest because for me it was like, it was just so random and it wasn't like, I think if you see someone, you know you're going to see them like at the stadium or something, like it's, it's less, you know, less impact. But uh, I saw him just, you know, obviously it was George's, George's agent was, you know, knew Eddie or was a friend of Eddie's. And uh, yeah, they came over and uh, I think they were going to come to the fight if they won. But unfortunately, I think we lost 1-0 that day or 1 or 2-0. Um, but yeah, it was a, a great experience. Had a good chat with Eddie. And uh, obviously he's a, a boxing fan, uh, mainly the Rocky films, I believe. But uh, he, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a real nice experience for me. It was, it just seemed that, you know, very... The stars had aligned that day for for Bournemouth to be playing Tottenham. I think a few of my mates went to the game and then come over and a few Cherries fans went to the game and then came straight over to the arena. Just about made it, I think. I think a couple might have even missed it because I was on so early. Um, yeah, but yeah, it was a great experience for me. I think one of his sons is actually called Rocky as well. Well, yeah. What did he tell you that night? Anything that stuck with you or anything? Advice, motivation? Uh, I, 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 to be honest, I was making weights. I probably can't, I can't remember the conversation when you. I was probably a bit dry at the time because you, you got to be a certain weight. Um, but no, we just. I think it was just a very general conversation about his. His, you know, he loves the sport and it's it's slightly different to football and, and stuff like that. Um, and but yeah, he, he had a lot of respect for for the sport in general. And uh, I know he he got George Groves to come down when uh, Bournemouth were playing Sheffield United away because that's where George won his world title at Bramwell Lane. Um, and I was there that night and it, he got George down to come do a, a talk for the lads. And uh, that was, uh, I was gutted. I, I couldn't come into the stadium that day. Eddie Howe and George Groves, that was my, uh, my sporting sporting idols t together. So that would have been a, an epic picture for me. George just sent me a, a picture of, of him and Eddie together and I was, I was very jealous. But uh, no, it was, uh, so yeah, obviously Eddie, Eddie's a, a big boxing fan and knows, you know, the, the, the mentality side of it and tried to use it with George as well. The ecstasy of winning your first pro fight, and then you suffered the agony of losing your to date only for the first fight you've lost to uh, Richard Reactpour at the O2 Arena. What what was that like? Because it cost you a title. What was it like to taste defeat for the first time? Yeah, it's a tough one. You know, in the corner, I'd gone back to the corner after the ninth round. There was a ten rounder, and they had me up. Um, had me up. I think they had me up two rounds. But I still thought, you know, go out there and make sure in the, in the last round. And it was a close last round. Um, we thought I'd won it. Um, and I was, I was confident. And he didn't seem too confident either at the end of the fight. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was one of them again where I performed okay. It wasn't my best performance now I look back. But at the time, I performed quite well. It was my first step up. And I uh, thought, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely done myself justice, even in defeat. So it's easier to take like that if, you know, if I'd gone in there and not performed and got soundly beaten, then it's there's there's no real excuses. And and for me, like I said earlier, it's always about the performance side of things. And I was pleased with my performance uh, at the time, so it was slightly easier to take. But um, I just remember walking out and, like I said earlier, watching my mate Dean box, and everyone chanting his name. I remember being at the start of my ring walk and everyone chanting Billum. And it's uh, I'd done over two hundred tickets, and and there was just this my name's going around the O2 Arena. So for me, like. I was able to enjoy it as well as get in there and, and, and perform. So uh, that was a, a nice memory for me. Obviously, it's a defeat. Uh, hopefully, one I can put right eventually. But um, off the back of it, I've you know got got back in the gym and, and put put the work in, and, and obviously got a couple of titles since. You say you bounced straight back four months after losing for the first time. You went back to the Liverpool Arena and you became WBA Commonwealth Cruiserweight weight champion. How? Sweet was that so soon to bounce back? Yeah, uh, to have a title fight straight after a loss is I was fortunate to get that opportunity, but I'd sparred Craig Glover before, who's uh, a very, very good fighter. And uh, it was really all or nothing that night for me in my head. I hadn't had the best camp, so I'd not sparred great. Uh, the last spar I had was okay, uh, was, a, was a better spar, but 
I'm very strong, you know, strong minded in the sense of doesn't matter what happens. It's um, you, you just got to go in there perform and it's almost like it, it'll be right on the night sort of thing in, in the sense of my mentality and regardless of what happens, I, I believe I could just turn that switch and turn it on the night. And that's what happened for me on, on, on that night in November um, 2019. I was able to, to get the victory against a good fighter and uh, nothing was stopping me that night. And it was a, an absolutely epic, epic um night for me i think the celebration showed that there's there's the video of me screaming after the ref steps in um so yeah it was a, a really big win for me and it, it done a lot for my career and my confidence on on that when you get a professional title for the first time to your name how did that change you i mean you're a very calm level-headed character we, we've we've seen and heard that from everything we've heard from you not just today but in, in the past on your podcast and your interviews and things as well but how did it change you did it change you or was it important that it didn't change you uh I got to do a pitch walk at the Liverpool game a couple of weeks later, which was here at the stadium, which was uh, about as about as far as it goes, you know, which is nice to to be able to to walk out onto a pitch which I dreamed of playing on, and still dream of hopefully fighting on one day uh, with with a belt that you know it was against Liverpool as well. I'd won the belt in Liverpool, uh, result didn't go away that that, that day unfortunately, but uh, no, like, I don't think I think I'm very once you achieve something, it seems very easy to do like if you told me 10 years ago when I started boxing or 12 13 years ago when I started boxing that you're going to be Commonwealth champion and you're going to do a pitch walk at AFC Bournemouth and all that then it's it's I would have you know I would have bit your arm off but now once you achieve it it's it seems like anyone can do it and uh the, the goal is you never I, I try and enjoy the moment and enjoy the journey as much as possible but then I'm always setting new goals so uh I think that keep and in the gym I'm surrounded by world class uh boxers. Obviously like like we spoke about earlier, Barry McGregor, who's a Hall of Famer, you you're never gonna beat his career really. Um it, the way it went and, and how he carried himself as a as a man. And then Shane's trained multiple world champions, I've sparred world champions and people have achieved a lot more than me. And um I think that helps keep keeping you grounded because you're not you're I'm just a you know a small fish in a big pond um, rather than, you know, if maybe if I trained in a different gym where no one had achieved anything and you you uh, and you win a big belt like the Commonwealth title or whatever it is, then, then it might have been different. But no, for me, I'm, I'm humbled by everyone I'm around. So there's uh, definitely no gloating or anything like that. And I've not achieved what I want to achieve yet. You mentioned in that answer that your dream is maybe to, or a dream is to fight out here at the stadium on the on the AFC Bournemouth playing surface. Does that, uh, in in a sort of strange sort of way, keep you motivated? Because that would be a big fight. That would be have to be a world title shot, presumably, to to make something happen here. And how how realistic is that kind of thing in terms of people would say, "What do you want to fight at the Bournemouth Stadium? You can fight at Wembley Arena or you know the O2 Arena with the greatest of respect to AFC Bournemouth Stadium." No, it's uh, it's it means a lot to me. Like I said, I've got so many good memories here. It's uh, football was always my my dream, my dream career. Uh, so the cl I'm not going to become a professional footballer. I'm not going to get paid for the club. So it's the closest thing I can get to it. Uh, but yeah, it'd be a an absolute. It, that is the dream to to fight. Obviously, fight for a world title. If we could fight for a world title here on the pitch, would would just be the ultimate goal. Um, I've, I'd absolutely love that. Fill fill the stadium out and. and you know, it'd be a uh, be a real special moment for me, and I mean, just to get a show down in Bournemouth now is sort of the shorter term goal. Is just to bring a TV, televised show down here. Um, that'd be great, uh, which we're we're working on. But um, yeah, it's uh, the the dream is to to fight on the pitch. How much of an inspiration is your stablemate Lawrence uh, Akoli? Because he obviously recently won his his world cruiserweight title, and he's a, a great example of someone who, in the space of what five, six, seven years, was working in McDonald's, was was completely out of shape and turned everything around, as, and has won a world title. Do you do you use him? I guess as an example of what you can achieve. Absolutely, you know Lawrence is a phenomenal athlete, and uh, his mindset is his mindset is fantastic. He's he's he puts the work in and some every day in the gym. Um, at one stage, you know, he, he, before he joined the gym, he was sort of, you know, what I was aiming towards to, to fight him. But he's just further on in his career um, than me. He's won a world title, looks to unify now, and then he wants to move up to heavyweight and, and give that a go. So, for, you know, we've, we've become good friends in the gym. I'm fortunate to have him in the gym for sparring and develop me as a fighter and, and, a, and an athlete as well. So it's, uh, it's great to have people like that in the gym who, like I said, I've been very fortunate to always pretty much, we've always had a world champion or at least someone fighting for a world title in the gym. So uh, you train, I was training for my first, second, third, fourth, fifth fight 
like a world champion because that's that's the only thing you can do in the gym is, is train at that level um, and I think that's what brought me on so much and Shane sets that uh, sets that precedent in, in, in the gym and just makes sure everyone's training at the elite level to, to achieve that goal. Chris, when you won this first title, you've spoken fondly about your circle of friends that you've known since since school days. You don't strike me as the sort of guy who's going to leave them behind. How did they and you celebrate that first title? Was it, you know, did you take everybody to Ibiza or did you just go to the Eiford Bridge Tavern or what? Uh, funnily enough, most of my close mates weren't there because it was one of my mates' birthday parties at night and the fight got, he'd already booked the venue down here. Uh, so most of them weren't there, so I might have to choose some new friends. No, uh, <laughs> yeah. So they they all they all celebrated down here. They all watched it in a in a club down here, and uh, they all got it got it on their iPad. They had like three iPads going and a screen as well, I think. And I think one of them was behind, so everyone's celebrating at one side of the room. But uh, I wish it had been videoed because I would have loved to have seen their reaction when, when I won. They just said, "Right then, let's." I think after the fight, they all got some shots in, and most of them don't remember the the rest of the night. So. Uh, <laughs> That's a, a pretty good story. But the week after, I, I just hired a, a little place out and got everyone down there and, and uh, you know, just celebrated with them. And it was great. So many people came came down and got to, you know, uh, thank them for their support. Um, and there was a, a few people there that night as well, friends and family, close friends that uh, I'd, I'd boxed with and stuff. Um, and then a, a few people made the trip all the way to Liverpool to, to come and watch me fight. So I hope that's one of the main reasons I would love to bring a show down here to to thank people for, for their support and traveling around the country to support me. I know you've said in the past how keen you are to encourage young people to take take up the sport. Now, there's a link with the Dorset Children's Foundation. A couple of our players have got a link with them as well. Just tell us tell us what your link is with the uh, Dorset Children's Foundation. Yeah, so uh, Alex Deutsch, now the chair, He um, he's a friend of mine from primary school. He a uh, massive Cherries fan as well. And he uh, asked me to if I'd like to be an ambassador, which is uh, an honor to be considered, you know, a big enough name to become a, an ambassador for such a great, great charity. Um, they do a lot of work and it's all nonprofit and they help so many children. And um, yeah, so I've become an ambassador for them. I'm actually seeing, I think they've got a football day. They're allowed to start up again on Saturday. So I'm going down there then. So that'd be, be great to see the kids and You've got, you know, most of the kids there are, are Bournemouth fans. I see them at the game sometime and, and it's great to, to see with them. But it's also gives the, the families a uh, connection and friendships with, you know, other parents going through similar situations with, with their children and stuff. But uh, it's a, a great, great charity, great foundation. And it's a real honour to, to be, a you know, an ambassador for them. I know you sparred with some of the goalkeepers here. Chris, just tell us which one of those could pack a punch. I think I took, yeah, I've taken them on the, on the pads. Uh, I took Arta on the pads and we did a bit of shoulder sparring as well at another part. Well, obviously now he's, he's left the club, but we, we keep in touch. And uh, and uh, Begovic as well as me was, took him on the pads and they were both very heavy handed. Um, and then obviously at the time uh, Rambo was here and, uh, and Mark Travers as well was, was uh, we, we were doing a few, I was just up the gym and helping out a little bit with them. But uh, now I think Be Begovic could, could use his reach uh, and his height, and he's definitely packing a punch as well, getting behind the jab, and uh, he, he cruises wave to a, to a few victories. <laughs> there aren't many people who admit to being happy to taking Arta Boric on anything involving punching or any kind of physical. That's, that was a brave man. Um, now, let's come bring it back to you, I guess, to Dorset sport and to, and to football, because you don't just follow the first team. You already mentioned you came to a game against Liverpool reserves and, uh, sorry, Arsenal reserves and Chelsea reserves, but you, you also go to under 21 and under 18 games before the, the pandemic hit as well. I mean, do you have particular links with, with those squads or is that just because you love watching the Cherries in any form? Yeah, well, my, uh, my friend uh, hosts a few of the under 21s and under 18s players and I got to know him a few, uh, Jake Scrimshaw, who's obviously at Newport County at the moment and, uh, yeah, he's obviously was scoring goal after goal for the under 21s. Um, yeah, and I just went and watched him. I think they played. Uh, I think they were playing Southampton up in um, up in Eastley Way. And yeah, I went when I watched that game. And yeah, I enjoy enjoy watching football. I love the sport. When I'm in camp, I watched them in the uh, the uh, when they played the Man City game here and watched them on the on my phone in camp. Uh, but yeah, it's, like I said, I love the sport and it's, it's great to see the, the younger lads coming through and, and, you know, getting in the in the squad now for the for the first team. And uh, yeah, I, like I said, I enjoy the sport. 
um, as a whole on, on all levels. And got a, a friend of her used to come down the boxing club, uh, Tommy Scott, who's goal, he's goalkeeper at Southampton under 21s now. So um, try, even though he's a Bournemouth fan, he's a he's a Bournemouth fan, but he's he has to put on the put on a Saints shirt to to get his games. But uh, I, I've told him it. I'll. Uh, We'll, we'll get him to the club one day. He's going to graft it, graft his way, and, and get to a proper club. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, this podcast will be uh, sort of bringing you to a new audience of Bournemouth fans as well. But a lot of them, of course, are aware of you already. Not just because you have a long link with the town, and you probably went to school with a lot of them, and and have sporting wise come up against a lot of them. But how have you found that the support from Bournemouth fans and everyone who knows about Bournemouth suddenly linking you and the and the club together? Yeah, it's uh, it's brilliant, and uh, I, I owe the club a lot for that. Obviously, they've they've shared a lot on my my you know information of fights and support me through twitter and, and all sorts and uh it's a real honor and then the fans have, have jumped on board as well which is which is great um and i'm very fortunate to have such a diverse fan base you know people i know and people i, I don't know you know getting messages which sometimes you get stopped in the, in the street walking through bournemouth and it's just crazy like um they might be wearing a, a, a cherry shirt or whatever it is. So I just get, you get stopped in the street and saying, well done on your fight and stuff. Like, you, you know, you don't know me. And it's just, even now, it's still so surreal to have such a, a wide and diverse fan base. And um, yeah, but the, the fans of the club are obviously ones that I'm very fortunate to have because we've got a similar interest in, in the club and, and they support me as well, which is nice. Chris, turning the clock back a few years, I remember working on the local paper and we didn't have too much to shout about when it came to individual sports. Nowadays, we've got people like Georgia Hall winning Open Championships and Scott Mitchell in darts and, and you on the, on the, in the boxing ring as well. Does it give you a sort of sense of pride to be putting the county on the sporting map alongside people like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I've got yourself to thank and, and Ian Wadley to thank for, for doing articles with me when I was an amateur. Uh, I don't know if I sent it to you or Ian. I was trying to trying to get in the paper because I used to collect articles of other boxers from in the local paper and have them up on my little pin board as as inspiration. So uh, no, yeah, thank you for for writing about me and, and sharing my name in the paper. But uh, yeah, like you know, Scott is obviously I've had him on my own podcast. A great bloke, supporter of the club, and uh, yeah, he's a uh, he's obviously now he's got his PDC tour card. I'm so happy for him because um, he's. It's been a while now since he won his BDO World World Championship, and you know a few years, but he's, he's kept grinding away, and uh, it's great. And then obviously Georgia Hall's doing so well in the golf. You know, one of the best golfers in the world. So um, yeah, it's it's mad to be put up there with those names, and to be in the paper alongside those names and and players or the club. You know, um, in, in the same paper for me, I, I still collect every article. Uh, I actually went out the other night because um, I'd done an interview with uh, Dan Rose from the Echo and uh, the somebody told me about half nine at night that I was in the paper that day and I hadn't gone out and got it and I tried to go out and everywhere had already packed their papers from that day away and I couldn't get it so I'm gonna have to write to Dan and uh try and get him to send me the articles and so I can uh so I can collect them all and, and yeah uh, I keep I'm very much one for memorabilia and getting all the uh getting all my paper cuttings out and, and stuff like that. Well, when it comes to me and Wadley, if there were any spelling mistakes in any of those articles, it would definitely be Wadley. <laughs> <laughs> Just going back to Scotty Dog, do you fancy your chances of beating him at darts? Uh, no, absolutely not. I, we, we used to have a dartboard in the gym and I played darts the other day. Actually, they did a nine dart challenge uh, in the in the bubble last week. And I, uh, I think I came second overall over the people they'd had in the bubble, even previous shows and stuff, which... I'm gonna I'm gonna blag that it was pure skill, but uh, the darts before that would, wouldn't suggest so. But uh, Scott did give me some of his darts, but I need to uh, definitely would love to to play a game with him, help him give me some tips. What about you beating him at boxing? What about him beating you at boxing? He's not my weight division. I think he's a heavyweight, so I have to avoid him. Uh, it might be might be heavy handed. He's got pretty heavy darts, so I know he likes a, a pretty. You know, I think he uses a twenty four gram dart, so that's quite a heavy dart. So he's obviously going to be heavy handed. So I wouldn't want to take a punch off him. What about if we were to compromise and put you on speedway bikes around Paul Stadium? How do you think you'd get? Oh, I don't know. I used to used to have a. Uh, I think my. My dad used to let us ride a little pit bike around Kings Park, actually, just next to the stadium. Um, so, yeah, I might, might be able to beat him on that one. 
Uh, interesting. Uh, Scott Mitchell was on your podcast uh, a few weeks back, wasn't he? Talking at uh, the Perfect Athlete podcast. By the way, we've got to drop it in somewhere. Great podcast. You've had Junior Stanislas on there as well, which is fascinating for uh, particularly listening to his penalty techniques and things like that. But just going back to you and Scott, you in vastly different sports, and Scott, Scott won't mind us um, saying that, I'm sure, and different weight divisions, as you correctly pointed out. But in terms of the individual nature of those, you mentioned it yourself earlier on about being fully in control. There's no one to blame if you haven't practiced your darts enough, if you haven't sparred well enough, there's nobody to blame apart from yourself. So it, I guess you draw parallels to those kind of sports. Georgia Hall would be the same in golf as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I the reason I got Scott on the podcast, I think people give to try and give darts a bad name. You know, it's just a pub game and all this. But these people that are saying that also aren't earning money from the sport. So it, it's funny if it's that easy, why aren't they, they doing it? But uh, I've got so much respect for all sports. Like I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I love all sports and, and I've always tried different sports and uh, the mindset to to be able to, you know, darts is the same motion over and over again. It'd be like a boxer standing still and just throwing one punch for time and time again. And for me, that's a mindset in itself to be able to do that. For me, it'd be boring, but for them to be able to keep doing it and keep pushing like it, that, that's a, a different mindset. And I've got a lot of respect for that. And that's exactly why I, I had him on the podcast. And yeah, that, that individualism of the sport, you know, it's, you know, it's down to you. Uh, and I think that's why I can draw parallels to them. The podcast is, is fascinating because obviously you're on the other side of the fence today. Which, which do you prefer, by the way, being asked the same questions about boxing over and again or being able to dictate the narrative yourself? Uh, this is nice, to, the usual, <laughs> uh, compared to the usual interviews I do. It's not just all boxing. It's uh, Obviously, it's, uh, uh, like I said, an honour to be on your club's podcast. But um, yeah, I, I love it, hosting as well. Um, it's, it's I need to get a few more guests in. I haven't released one for a while, and I think uh, I'm getting getting told off by a few people, few yeah, listeners. To worry about. I mean, they they've got to cut you some slack, haven't they? Yeah, well, that's <laughs> it. I've, I've been in camp and stuff, so it's sort of been back in my mind. But um, no, I, I love it, and I love. For me, it's not. I don't do it for. It doesn't make me money or anything like that, or business or anything like that. It's just a passion of mine, and I just uh, love finding those ones and two percents in different sports, different athletes. Uh, and seeing what what makes people you know, how they improve and if I can use it, I, it even better. But um, yeah, it's really really interests me and I just uh, love being love being a host of a podcast. It's the perfect athlete podcast. Once you finish listening to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast and all the back catalogue episodes, of course, as well. And there's a great <laughs> back back catalogue of Chris Willem Smith's uh, podcast. Um, just before we've got some supporter questions to finish with in a in a second as well. But let's just uh, scroll back briefly to your recent uh, fight against Vasil uh, Dusar, where you uh, it was a uh, a close decision, wasn't it? On points, um, WBA Continental Cruiserweight title at Wembley Arena. Um, a couple of weeks ago. And first of all, lots of people have watched it. We've already talked about it. Um, how did you feel that fight went? Obviously, you got the result you wanted, but did you get the performance you wanted? Yeah, I felt very much in control in the fight after watching it back. I think um, I think I got a lot of stick for taking quite a few shots and I can see why watching it back, but it's strange in there. I just don't seem to feel half the punches. Um, like you, you feel them when you get hit with a really good shot and you get buzzed, but I think all the, unless they buzz buzz me at the moment, I don't seem to feel them, which is a bad thing moving forward. You know, you're, you're losing points. The whole idea is to hit and not get hit. So uh, any boxers that are watching me don't do what I do and, and take too many <laughs> shots. Um, but no, it's uh, it was a good learning fight for me. I knew how tough he was. I don't think anyone else has dropped him twice in, in a fight and I managed to do that. So uh and he's been in there with some good good opponents as well so it's uh it was a real really good fight for me to get another 10 rounds in felt very comfortable in there had another gear uh which but i didn't want to have to you know use it because i knew how tough he was and if you don't get him out of there then you can be you can be absolutely you know done in and and you know he can get on top and get some confidence um so yeah i felt very much in control in the fight and obviously got a couple of knockdowns as well and Sh shane was pleased uh but there's plenty to work on as well so uh, I'll be doing that now. And what is the next target in terms of time scale? What, when are you looking to fight again and what's what's looking like it's in the pipeline? Uh, we're trying to get the European title again, uh, shot against Tommy McCarthy, um, who's from, from Northern Ireland. So it'd be, a, you know, he boxes on match room as well. So it'd be a great, great fight. He's to make very similar stage of our career. He's also got a loss to Richard Riappo. Um And yeah, that'd be a great fight for me. I love that in the summer. Uh, I think he's got one defense first. So I'd, I'd love to be able to get that Um yeah, get that fight um, made for the summer. Uh, but if it's later in the summer, then hopefully I can get someone in in the meantime because I like to stay busy. I've been very fortunate during the pandemic to box twice already. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully I can get that, that fight, 
uh, fight signed off and then uh, hopefully box in the meantime as well. One more football one before we do some questions. Chris, when the Cherries clinched promotion to the Premier League by beating Bolton out here, I understand you attended the game wearing fancy dress. Can you tell us what you were wearing and why? Uh, I'm going to have to correct you. I wasn't attending the game. Me and my mate watching it. You can see his house from here. At his house, because we can get a ticket. And he was like, all right, if we, get, if we win, we'll go. We'll run over the stadium. He's like, should we dress up? So he's got a Tweety Pie Sylvester costume. I can't even remember which one I was now. I think I was Tweety Pie. So I dressed up as Tweety Pie. Uh, and he dressed up as Sylvester. We ran across, managed to run through the gate on the pitch. And then we managed to get on Sky Sports and everything because one of our other mate came and he was wearing, I think he borrowed my mate's mum's blouse and that was it. <laughs> uh, so he had like no trousers on, just in his boxer shorts. And, and, and uh, I think even, I think who was commentating that day? I think, what was it, Jake Humphrey? No, was, I can't remember who was commentating. Someone was commentating and uh, yeah, they would say, oh my God, uh, oh my goodness, the man with no trousers on. And uh, that was uh, <laughs> one of my mates and I was stood next to him dressed as Tweety Pie. So pretty, uh, pretty funny story. <laughs> okay, we're going we're gonna, to uh, get getting towards the end, Chris, but we always uh, on the uh, on Twitter, hashtag AFCB pod, ask some supporters for a few questions to, to finish with. Um, let's first of all go with um, Paul Dean's uh, question, who says, who is your favourite Cherries player of all time and who, in your opinion, is the best cruiserweight of all time? You may have touched on the first bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, my favourite player, I have so many favourite players, to be honest. Like I said, uh, James Hayter was, was always one of mine. Wade Elliott was just pure class because of the, the, you know, used to watch him just dribbling around player after player. Um, Fletch, obviously, is a, a massive one for me and him scoring, you know, important goals. Uh, and I obviously got to walk out of the testimonial. So, um, and also Brian Stock as well because I enjoyed his free kicks. So, I'll probably say if I've got to go with one, you, you've got to go with Fletch. He'll be loving hearing that. He'll be loving it. He'll be listening, tuning in, especially for that. Best cruiserweight of all time? Uh, Evander Holyfield for me. He's just, he moved up to heavyweight as well, but uh, he was just an absolute force and he, he could take a shot, that's for sure. But he was just, uh, I love watching his fights. He's got some epic battles and was definitely up, up there with the best cruiserweights of all time, if not the best. Um, David Cordell wanted to know, would you rather win a world title or see the Cherries win the Premier League title? Oh, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. Uh, yeah, I, 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 that is a tough one. I'd, I'd have to, for selfish reasons, say, say myself, but uh, win, watching the Cherries win, a, win a, a Premier League title would also be absolutely epic. A very, very close second. Jonathan Gokrogers is asking if you could fight any cruiserweight from any generation, who would it be? Stupidly, I'd probably say Evander Holyfield. <laughs> but uh, it's, yeah, he was, uh, like I said, he's one of my favourite fighters ever. He was such a um, such a tough opponent and and the, the name and obviously what he went on to achieve at, at heavyweight as well. Uh, yeah, he was just so exciting. Um, I think he's probably got a better chin than I have. And probably punches harder than I have, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on me, but I, I would have loved to have shared the ring with Evander. Now, Alex from Iford is asking, when will your merchandise be available to buy? It is, it is. Uh, keep an eye out on my uh, <laughs> on my Instagram, if, if you, and I'll, I need to put it up on my Twitter as well. Uh, so yeah, well, thanks for the plug, uh, Alex, and uh, I'll make sure he uh, make sure he gets some uh, get some merch online soon. A final question. Um, it's quite a hard-hitting question, actually. Um, Chris, you might want to think about this one. Ben from Bournemouth is asking, is it true you can down a large Domino's pizza in under three minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly who that is. I know exactly. That's, that's my mate who I went on the pitch of. I guarantee it. Um, I did it at his house once, right? Uh, we ordered a Domino's pizza. Uh, literally just over there, like I said, the house we can see. Uh, and I, I said to the lads how... how uh, how quick do you reckon you could eat a Domino's in? And one of my mates said, eight minutes. I said, eight minutes. I said, that's ages. I said, I reckon I could do it under three. Uh, I, so obviously then I had to try it because the Domino's was on its way. Uh, and I did it in three minutes and 19 seconds. But uh, I, the only reason I didn't do it under three is because it burnt, burnt my mouth. I had a blister on top of my mouth for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the pitfalls of it, trying to eat a Domino's too quickly. By the way, how many Domino's mentions have been on this podcast in the last few weeks? They don't want to sponsor it by now. They should be. I, I just want to add in there that there are other pizza right. places available. Yes. Right? 
particularly locally here in Bournemouth. If you're a local Bournemouth pizza restaurant, honestly, sponsor it and bring the pizzas in. Uh, Kenneth Tucknot, by the way, mentioned for you as well, you asked a question that we asked earlier on about uh, Chris's uh, hopes of being a boxer from earlier on in his life. And Chris, it would be remiss of us, finally, not to get your thoughts on this current season for AFC Bournemouth and whether you have a, a feeling that the Premier League dream is going to happen. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think obviously... Woody's doing a great job now with the, with the club. Not not that Jason wasn't, uh, but yeah, I think they just seem as a fire in the belly from the lads. Uh, Swansea win was a massive, massive win. Swansea have been doing really well. Um, obviously, Barnsley are flying. So we, I think we've we've hit a few teams where they're on form and we've played them when they're really on absolute fire, like Barnsley. Uh, but Reading seem to be, you know, dropping dropping down now. Uh, and if we can win our win the game in hand, get back into into the playoffs, you know it's uh it's it's very much in touching distance. Uh, lads are hitting some form, and uh, once obviously Junior's back soon as well, and I think he's been one of the, the best players of the season. He's been, you know, uh, I'm not saying it's all because of him coming on my podcast, but I'm going to take some credit <laughs> for it because it seems to have hit some form after that. Uh, but no, I think. You know, we've had some really good performances from the lads. We've got a good, strong squad. The depth in the squad's huge, you know, especially centre midfield. It's it's hard to pick the the, the three in midfield if you're paying three in midfield. Uh, you know, what three do you put? I know everyone's got a different opinion. Um, but yeah, I think playoffs is, is very much a realistic target. And uh, I think I, I'd absolutely love love to see the lads back in the playoffs and uh, back in the Premier League. Yeah, and we uh, would absolutely love to see you, hopefully, and the rest of the fans back in the stadium as well, watching games uh, very, very shortly. Chris, uh, it's been a, a real education for, for certainly for me, and I, I know for Neil and for everyone listening at home. Keep putting Bournemouth on the sporting mat, won't you, as well as the, the football team are, are trying to do. Best of luck for your upcoming fight, whichever one it ends up being in the summer, whether it be against, uh, against Tommy for the European title. But on behalf of the Cherries fans listening, the Commonwealth and Continental Cruiserweight champion, Chris Billum-Smith, thank you very much. Thank you, lads. Appreciate it. <laughs> So that was uh, top man, top boxer and top Cherries fan, Chris Billum-Smith. Great to have him on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. And as you rightly said, Neil, doing a, a huge amount to put Bournemouth on the sporting map. Yeah, well, as I said in the, in the post podcast, Chris, not too many boxing stories to write about in the Bournemouth and Dorset area down the years. Same with golf and, and darts until Georgia Hall and Scott Mitchell came along. And it's refreshing to have a chat with someone about an interest in a different sport as well as having such an affiliation for the football club, dressing up as Sylvester or what it was and et cetera. So it was a really informative hour we've had there. Absolutely. And of course, uh, for everyone listening who presumably is a, a Bournemouth fan, right in the same boat as, as all of you, I guess, as well. So whatever your podcast platform asks you for a rating, the answer is five stars. Any nice comments are always welcome as well. If you want to look up Chris's podcast, it is the Perfect Athlete podcast on your platform as well. We'd love it if you could share ours on social uh, directly to fellow fans of football or, or to boxing or to both, uh, to come and have a listen. Anyway, our thanks again to Chris Billum-Smith from Neil Perrett and myself, Chris Temple. Thanks for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. <laughs>